wonderful people. I hope you're all doing well considering eventually things will get back to normal. Today I'm going to take a different spin on a case. Um, first because there's not a lot of information on the victims, but secondly because David Barnett's story when I, while I was researching blew my mind. He had a horrific childhood and it might explain he, why he did what he did to his adoptive grandparents. There was so much detailed information about his childhood from his appeal that I couldn't fit all of it in here. I think this video is already going to be long, but I tried to get as much as I could. Now, if you've watched I'm a Killer on Netflix, you probably already know who he is. I know not long after the episode aired, there was a lot of people fighting to free David from prison. So after you hear David's story, I'd like to hear your opinion. Um, do you think he should stay in prison for life or do you think he should get a chance to go in front of the parole board? Uh, please watch the whole video so you can get a full understanding about everything that he's gone through. Just a forewarning, there is talk of physical and sexual harm towards children. I know that's strange wording, but with the YouTube algorithm, I didn't want it to mess with my video. In January of 1996 and the beginning of February 1996, David was staying with friends. He was 19 years old and he was at a bit of a low point in his life. A month earlier, he and his girlfriend, who was also the mother of his son, they had broken up. While with his friends, he was constantly talking about his adoptive grandparents' car, a 95 Dodge Intrepid, and he claimed that they had said they would rent the car to him. The morning of February 4th, 1996, David broke into his grandparents' house in Glendale, Missouri. He came in through the window. Now it was 8 a.m. on a Sunday, so Leona and Clifford Barnett weren't there, they were in church, and after church they always went to brunch, it was their routine every Sunday. David made himself at home, of course he had been there several times, it was his grandparents' house. He watched some TV and then he took a nap on the couch. When he woke up from his nap, he called his stepbrother to tell him that he had won the lottery. Around 1 p.m., Clifford and Leona got back from brunch and David confronted them. He told them how his adopted father, their son, was inappropriate with him. Then he pushed Leona down in the hallway and Clifford down in the living room. He ran to the kitchen to grab a knife and Clifford started to get up, but David kicked him in the head, which made him topple back down to the ground. And then David repeatedly stabbed Clifford over and over. Clifford had 10 stab wounds in the neck, plus cuts on his face, neck, and hands. Once David believed that Clifford was gone, he ran and grabbed another knife from the kitchen and proceeded to stab Leona. She had 12 stab wounds to her neck, as well as cuts all over her face. David grabbed his grandparents' car keys and he took $120 from Leona's purse. Before he left, he laid down next to both of them to listen to their breath to see if they were still alive. And then he closed the shades and locked the door behind him. He took off driving the Dodge Intrepid. Now the next morning, the police found the car in a residential area of Glendale. And when David saw the police, he went up to them and confessed immediately to what he had done. He was found guilty of for two counts of first degree murder. His lawyer tried to get him a lighter sentence because he suffered from depression, bipolar disorder, and PTSD. But regardless, the jury decided to sentence him to death. They said that his crimes were unreasonably brutal and that he committed repeated and excessive acts of violence. In 2015, a judge decided to overturn 
the death penalty and give him life with parole. His lawyers argued that his original lawyer should have spoken more on his childhood abuse and the judge agreed that that may have played a factor in what the jury had decided. As we speak, his lawyers are trying to get him uh, life with parole, with a chance to have parole. Their argument is that he was only 19 when the crimes occurred, therefore he was a teenager and teenagers brains aren't fully developed and they have more impulse control issues. If he wins his case, this will overturn the life sentence for all teenagers in Missouri who have gotten convicted of first degree murder. Now we're going to discuss David's childhood, which is more disturbing than the murders. David's mother, Shirley Ackery, started drinking at 15. Her mother was a drunk who was abusive and mean towards her. Eventually, Shirley was going out almost every night to drink, and she really liked her married men. Shirley was 17 when she got pregnant for the first time, and it was from a married man and she continued to take diet pills and drink while she was pregnant. Her second child was David, and his father was also a married man, Joseph Castaldi. He was known for being abusive to his wife, and after David, Shirley would go on to have more, four more children, all from married men. While Shirley was pregnant with David, she continued to drink and take diet pills. She wanted nothing to do with David even before he was born. She even told one of her friends that, she, in quotes, I hate this effing baby. David was born May 18, 1976, and it was rough from the start. Shirley had no desire to be a mother to her oldest or to David. She wouldn't show him any affection. She neglected him. Often, it seems like her friends would have to take care of him. They lived on and off with one of Shirley's friends, Mary, but on a whim one day, she gave David to a lady of the night whose nickname was Crazy Janie, and Janie was a bad addict who was in and out of it most of the time. And when Mary found out about this, Mary went to see Janie, and David was crawling around in a dirty diaper. He had sores from his diaper not being changed, so she took him back. For four months, David lived with Mary's sister, Barbara, and her husband, Robert, and it didn't last very long because Robert was extremely abusive to Barbara, and then one day she watched him slap David on the back of the head, and he's just a little baby, so she left Robert and she brought David back to his mother, Shirley, but of course Shirley being Shirley, because she seems like a real winner, she brought the kid back to Robert. Barbara wanted David back and she was worried about him being with Robert, but she was too scared to do anything or to fight for him. Even after splitting from Robert, he was abusive towards her. He would confront her in town whenever he saw her. And one day, he even drove his car full speed into the side of her car with David in the back seat. Robert could be kind to David one day and then in a violent rage the next. Um, he has a vague rem memory of being about three or four years old sitting in the bathtub and there's a woman he doesn't know standing over him and the next thing he knows he had blinding pain he had been struck in the nose now David had to have two surgeries and still his nose is deformed to this day at the age of five Robert took David to an apartment above a bar where he said all the women were naked and walking around and some of them were instructed to touch him inappropriately. Now, later on, Robert was diagnosed with alcoholism, with drug use, as well as anti-social anti personality disorder. Due to concerns, the Division of Family Services, or DFS, were involved in their lives. Um, after one visit with DFS, Robert took David and took off. They were gone for six months. For two of those months, 
They lived in Robert's car, and there were times that Robert would make David hide in the trunk. They would stay on and off with Robert's sister and mother. Um, eventually, Deborah, his sister, would take custody of David, but it wasn't a much better situation. Deborah was not a stable person. She wouldn't take him to school every day, and her mother, Robert's mother, was disabled and he was the one that had to take care of her and if he did anything she didn't like she would beat him with a cane. When David was six and a half years old he was finally taken away by DFS and put in a residential facility. To get David back Robert had to sign a paternity statement and show a uh, history of employment, which were both things that Robert refused to do. When David was seven years old, he was placed with a foster family for six months. He really felt at home there. He said it was one of the happiest times of his life. His foster parents noticed that if they would confront him about anything, he would flinch like they were going to hit him. Even though everybody got along, David would get angry and frustrated easily. He had a hard time understanding his own emotions. But the entire time he was with them, he went to counseling and he cooperated. This foster family decided to move to England and they wanted to take David with them and David wanted to go with them, but Robert wouldn't sign paternal rights away. For a year, he went to live with another stable foster family. Um, they described him as a good kid, and he even became kind of close with his sister, but he was still struggling. He would get in trouble at school, but it was minor things, nothing serious. But whenever they would confront him, he would flinch because he thought they were going to hurt him, or he'd be scared because he thought they were going to scream at him. He was often bullied for his nose, as well as for being behind in school. Uh, he couldn't read, he hardly went to school because of Robert, but thankfully there was a teacher who would stay after school with him and spend extra time with him, and by the end of the school year, he still wasn't where he was needed to be, but he was a lot further along than he had been. For some reason, DFS had approved supervised visits for Robert, and so they would have these supervised visits, and Robert would promise all these things that he was going to get him back and they were going to do this, but none of it ever came to anything and eventually he stopped showing up. But eventually this meant that David could be adopted, but his foster family at the time, they loved him, but they said that he needed more focused attention than they could give him. So his caseworker went to work finding him a family. In the meantime, he was still going to counseling. He felt really abandoned, he had poor self-esteem, he was anxious all the time. And eventually a school teacher, a computer high school computer teacher by the name of John Barnett, wanted to adopt David. Now the caseworker did some interviews with him, interviews with his references, and something didn't feel right. She did not think that he should be able to adopt David. But her supervisor took authority and decided that John was a good candidate and gave him David, who was eight years old at the time, as a foster son to see how things went. It was around this time that Robert passed away. John Barnett would go on to adopt David and two other boys. At first it seemed like he finally had a home and on the outside it looked like everything was great. He was going to school, he excelled at sports, now he was still insecure and he got into a lot of fights because he was bullied or because he would see somebody who is disabled being bullied and he would stick up for them. In grade school, John had him going to a speech teacher twice a week for his lisp as well as a research teacher for his behavior and I'm not quite sure what a research teacher is like I have an idea in my head but if any of you can explain elaborate it please drop me a comment that would be awesome this is where it gets bad even in grade school his friends knew something was off at home there was two friends that talked about how they would wake up in the middle of the night and David would be gone 
Well, one night, one of those friends decided to go see where he went, and he heard John and David behind a closed door. Now, I'm not going to repeat what he heard, but it pointed to sexual harm towards David. John gave David his first Playboy at a really young age, and he would make him sit on his lap and kiss him in front of his friends until it was like fourth or fifth grade. But it was this wasn't the only way that he was abused. He was also physically abused. John would beat him and his two brothers. John was a drunk, so his moods were unpredictable. He would hit them in the stomach, in the head, in the face while wearing his class ring. It didn't take long for David to start showing the classic symptoms of sexual and physical violation. He had agitated depression, which agitated depression is simply depression with an agitated state, with anger, with restlessness. He had trouble concentrating in school. He had anxiety. He had a serious fear of being physically hurt and a serious fear of abandonment. David was trying to work on his issues. He was going to counseling in school and outside of school. By middle school, he would run away a lot. He would show up at his best friend's house with a busted lip or a black eye. It happens frequently. Now, this story is according to his friend. One day, he showed up with an obscene picture. Now, I'm not sure. Their faces weren't showing, but I'm not sure if it was John and David or John and another young boy. But... David's best friend convinced him to go to the police station, so they did. Showed them the photo, and he was interviewed for quite a long time, but nothing was ever done. Which I don't understand, because that kind of photograph is illegal. I can't say the wording, because of the algorithm, but you know what I'm trying to say. One friend's mother described David as a good kid. She watched him grow up. He had been friends with her son since they were eight years old. And when he hit his teens, he started staying over longer. He would vacuum, help do dishes, even babysit as long as he got to stay for a longer period of time. And even when he was gone from home forever, James would never come looking for him. In high school, David would admit that he is been suicidal since the age of eight. Now, in his teenage years, he tried to hurt himself on several occasions, but only two of those times did he have to go to the emergency room. The first time, he tried to overdose on prescription medication. The second time, he wrote a suicidal note in school, and then he proceeded to douse himself in gasoline and set himself on fire. After the fire attempt, he would be put in a psychiatric center. They eventually diagnosed him with depression, bipolar disorder, and oppositional defiant disorder. The center recommended long-term care for him, but John took him out anyway. At one point, John let a 16-year-old girl move in with them. She was one of his students. Her name was Cecil and she kept running away. I believe she had a bad home. Well, they were having a sexual relationship. The authorities eventually found out, but Cecil denied it when she was confronted. She was afraid to admit to it. Now, John's behavior towards David and his brothers and other underage people was not a secret. In fact, there had been six calls to DFS about it. When David was 15, one caller reported that they saw John choke a child and that he would leave knots in the back of the boys' head from hitting them with a ring. Another report was about him hitting David in the back with a wooden roller and then punching and slapping him in the face. Another call was his friend's mom who told DFS that he was staying at her house for a long time, and when he would come over, he'd be covered in bruises. Now, finally, they decided to investigate after that one. 
and David was honest with DFS about everything that John was doing to him. But because John denied it, I guess the case was dropped, which is stupid because we all know creeps like to admit to what they do. Later on, there was another DFS investigation, and they got the police involved who did their own investigation, and both DFS and the police found that there was something wrong and that they were being abused, and the police sent a report to the prosecuting attorney's office, but nothing was ever done. John never received charges, the boy stayed with him. The system really let these kids down. Later on, David started dating Cecil, and yes, the same one that John was taking advantage of. And if I'm mispronouncing her name, I apologize, because I was thinking it could be Cecil. And I know I watched the episode on Netflix, but I can't remember. But anyway, eventually she got pregnant with his son, Sethan. And when Sethan was born, David stepped up. He worked two jobs. He would help change diapers and did whatever Cecil asked of him. But it was a toxic relationship. Cecil was violent towards him. She would hit him. And one time, one of the times they broke up, she had her, a group of her friends jump him because she was mad, about, mad at him. They lived together for over a year before they finally fully broke up, and this was about a month before he committed his violent crimes. Now David has been sitting in prison since he was 19 years old, and we can all agree that he needed needs to pay for what he did. But I ask you, do you think he deserves a chance at parole, or do you think he should stay with life in prison? I'm not sure how I feel. I know what he did was horrific, and his grandparents weren't even the ones that hurt him, but I also know that with a childhood like that, it's pretty traumatic. It's going to mess you up. It's going to make you not right in the head. He didn't have a chance to fully get over that. He was never helped. He was stuck in that situation, and no amount of counseling is going to help some kid if they're still going home every day to the same abuse. So please let me know your opinions. Um, if you have a Midwest true crime case you'd like to like me to do, please drop a comment and I love getting suggestions. If you like my content, please like and subscribe and until next time.